One second. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, and thanks a lot to the organizers for all their hard work. Um, yeah, so I'm Victoria and Alistair and I are going to be presenting seamlessly together uh, two uh, works which happened in parallel and we're presenting together because it turned out that we were solving the same problem, uh, basically using the same tool uh, in both of these works. Uh, and that problem is trying to bound and characterize quantum contextuality using semi-definite programs or SDPs and SDP hierarchies. Um, so we're interested in generalized contextuality. Uh, and the way we're going to study that is through what we call contextuality scenarios. So a contextuality scenario is just a prepare and measure experiment with some extra constraints upon it. So in a prepare and measure experiment, we take our physical system and we prepare it in one of capital X different ways. So in a given round, we will uh, make a preparation PX. Uh, and these are kind of pre-selected ways that we prepare our system. Uh, and then we perform one of capital Y different measurements. So in a given round, we will measure MY, and then we obtain one of uh, capital B different outputs. Uh, so this output B, and then we can do this over and over again for all the different combinations of X and Y. So it's just prepare and measure. But then uh, an important concept in generalized contextuality or Speckens contextuality, as it's sometimes known, uh, is that of operational equivalence. So if we're in some operational theory, like, so for example, uh, you can think of quantum theory, we say that two preparations are operationally equivalent, so P and P prime, if no matter what measurement in our theory we were to perform on these two preparations, we would always get the same statistics. So we couldn't distinguish whether we'd done P or P prime to prepare our system. And then we can also define the same concept for uh, the measurement outcomes or measurement effects as we often call them. So we're gonna denote a measurement effect like this. So the, the M uh, denotes the measurement and then, so B given M is seeing outcome B given that you performed measurement M. Uh, so then we say that two of these effects are operationally equivalent. If no matter what preparation we perform the measurement on, the outcome occurs with the same probability. So like these two outcomes are in this sense also indistinguishable from one another. So then uh, we want to involve this concept in our prepare and measure experiment. And the way we do that is by imposing that some of the, uh, so for example, the preparations that we use have to satisfy some operational equivalence. So I have an example here, and it would be that if you took an equal mixture of the first two preparations, that this gives you an operationally equivalent preparation to an equal mixture of the second two if there were four preparations in your experiment. And then I have a similar example for the uh, measurement effects. So here uh, we have an equal mixture of the zeroth outcome of two measurements is equivalent to an equal mixture of the, the one, the first <laughs> uh, outcome uh, of those two measurements also. Um, so then our uh, scenario is defined by this tuple here at the top P, uh, which is the number of uh, preparations, the number of measurements, the number of outputs in every measurement, and then some set of operational equivalences on the preparations and some set of operational equivalences on the measurements. So for the measurements, it would example look like this, but you could have as many of these equivalences as you like. Um, so then if you have a theory which describes the system that you're using in this experiment, it's going to be able to tell you uh, this number here, which is the probability of seeing outcome B, given that you made preparation X and performed measurement Y. Um, so then if you take all of these probabilities for all values of B, of B, X and Y, you can put them into a vector, which will be in R to the X, Y, B. And we call this vector the behavior of the system because it basically describes how the system is going to behave. Um, and we're interested in, 
in different physical theories, what sets of these behaviors P can we find or can we possibly achieve? Um, so if you're familiar with Bell non-locality, I have a, an analogy on the left-hand side of the screen uh, where we have the set of local correlations, quantum correlations, and non-signaling correlations. So because we get a very similar structure in the contextuality scenarios, I just put this here, but if you're not familiar with it, don't worry, it's not what we're talking about. Like, uh, it's just to help people that have seen it before. Um, so the situation that we are concerned with, so we have our prepare and measure experiment with um, our operational equivalences imposed, and then we're looking at uh, the sets of behaviors that we can see from different types of theory. So uh, this is just a diagram representing them in 2D, but obviously they're, much, they're in much higher dimensions. So to start with, we have the set of uh, the non-contextual set. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, because we're not that concerned with this set, um, if you don't know, so um, if your theory can be described by a non-contextual ontological model, the behaviors that you will see will lay in this set. But if you don't know what a non-contextual ontological model is, uh, all you need to know is that uh, basically any uh, classical physics or classical theory that you know uh, will be described by one of these models but specifically quantum theory cannot be described in this way. And that's like the important thing for this talk. Um, so that brings us to the quantum set. So these are the behaviors that you can realize in quantum theory. Uh, and this set will like strictly contain the non-contextual set. And we can uh, sort of measure how much the quantum set goes outside the non-contextual set using non-contextuality inequalities, which are kind of an analogy to Bell inequalities, if you know what those are. Um, and so these will basically be some like linear combination of the, uh, of the probabilities in P. And when you're in a non-contextual ontological model, uh, this linear combination will always be less than a certain value. Uh, you will get a value less than this SNC and everything below the line you would get so you would violate this inequality so you get something greater so the the quantum behaviors can violate this inequality uh, so just as a quick example you know you could just add together three of these probabilities from the vector uh, and in the in an NC model you would get that this has to be less than 2.5 um, I haven't told you the scenario but uh, I can tell you later um, so this, uh, the NC set is a polytope, and that means it can be characterized by a linear program. And if you want to know more about that, you can check out this paper here where they uh, give you a method to do that. But for this talk, um, the thing that we are concerned with is characterizing the quantum set. So this is the problem we are interested in and turns out to be quite difficult. Um, so I'll quickly just give you a, a more um, rigorous, uh, explicit definition of the quantum set, and then I'll give pass over to Alistair so he can uh, tell you about their method. Um, so we have that a behavior P, so P of B given X, Y, is uh, contained in the quantum set if you can find some quantum realization of the behavior. So that's going to be some density operators, rho X, so one for every X, and some POVMs, uh, so these are both on some Hilbert space, some separable Hilbert space. Uh, so then there's a POVM uh, EY for every measurement Y. Um, and these need to be such that if you use the, the Born rule, you get the probability of B given XY. So you'll, you're kind of realizing this uh, behavior uh, using quantum theory with these states and measurements. Um, but then finally, the, the density operators in the POVMs also have to satisfy the operational equivalences that are imposed by the scenario. So if your equivalence was like that, uh, the equal mixture of P0 and P1 had to be equivalent to an equal mixture of P2 and P3, this basically means that if you take those mixtures of the density operators, they have to be like mathematically equal to each other. So that's how you impose the equivalences um, in quantum theory, 
And exactly the same thing holds for the measurement effects. So these are like the elements of the POVMs and the, the mixtures have to be equal to each other. Um, so the kind of questions that we want to answer are first, like what are the maximal violations that you can get in quantum theory of uh, these non-contextuality inequalities? So I had the same example from before and in quantum theory, you can get like 2.866, so on. If you remember 2.5 was the maximum in the NC set. So like that's the first question in general, we want to answer how to find these kind of numbers. And also if we're given a behavior, we want to decide, is it in the set Q or is it not in the set Q? And actually due to uh, an analogy with Bell scenarios, we know that in some cases, this problem is actually undecidable, right? So it's been shown to be undecidable for these Bell scenarios and there's a map between them. So we know in some cases this will be true. Uh, so that's why we're trying to use the techniques uh, which we're about to tell you. So, okay, so I'll stop sharing now and pass to Alistair, hopefully he's ready. Yep. Right, so thank you for the introduction. It was very nice and I'll take over now. So uh, put full screen, um, right. So I'm gonna present the first of the two hierarchies um, that you'll see in this talk. And so that uh, this is based on this paper here, bounding and simulating uh, contextual correlations in quantum theory. And this actually appeared just in PRX Quantum last Friday, so just in, just in time. Um, so, so I guess the idea of using hierarchies of STPs to, to bound the sets of quantum behavior um, in different scenarios is not something that's new. So maybe uh, many of you might have heard of the MPA hierarchy. And so this was perhaps the first of these hierarchies and has now become a rather standard tool for the analysis of um, correlations in Bell scenarios, or for example, looking at the violation of Bell inequalities. And this type of approach has also been adapted for various prepare and measure scenarios. Um, for example, dimension bounded correlations, um, okay, there's, there's many others, but until now, at least there hasn't been any work trying to adapt this to contextuality, despite it being one of the most common um, kind of scenarios of interest in quantum information. And there's a couple of reasons, uh, well, maybe reasons for this or difficulties that arise when one tries to extend it to contextuality. And so the first of these is how to enforce the operational equivalences within the hierarchy itself in STPs. And unlike say Bell, Bell inequalities and, and most other uh, cases that have been studied, it's not necessarily clear that we can assume um, that we always have pure states or projective measurements. And this complicates things a little bit. So everything I'm going to say, at least in my part, I'm just going to focus on preparation non-contextuality. So this is the case where we only have non-trivial equivalences between preparations. Um, most of what I say will generalize uh, fairly easily, but I think looking at this kind of slightly more simpler scenario allows me to already express all of the main ideas behind our hierarchy. So the hierarchy that we've um, we formulated it as based on a connection we create between preparation non contextuality and um, zero information games. So, what are these zero information games? Well, if we take kind of an example, say that I think this is the same set of operational equivalences between states we saw just in the introduction, we can kind of think of this as dividing the states into, into three sets with some coefficients. And we can play a game where, say, one, one player, Alice, picks randomly one of these three sets of states and then randomly picks a state X from within the set. So we'll label the set K and the state X. It sends the state to, to say Bob, and Bob has to guess which set K the state came from. And we can show that the operational equivalences are satisfied if and only if Bob can do no better than guessing at random the value of K. Or another way to put this is that the accessible information um, in the many entropic sense about K um, given G is, is zero. And the reason this connection is, is kind of useful for trying to create the hierarchy for contextuality is that it allows us to adapt recent results um, from the study of informationally restricted correlations um, to apply them to contextuality. And in particular, there was a hierarchy formulated for this recently. So I'll try and give a very brief um, idea of the intuition of, of how the hierarchy works. I guess the full details are very technical. You have to look at the paper. But just to recall the question, what we're looking at is say, given some probability distribution that's fixed, we want to know are there some states and measurements that reproduce those statistics and satisfy the operational equivalences. And so these states, we don't want to assume they're pure, as I mentioned before. So we take these to be 
um, mixed states or density operators um, with arbitrary dimension. But in the case of preparation and non-contextuality, we can assume that the measurements are projective. Yeah? And in the more general case, we can't. And so the idea behind the hierarchy, similar to many other SDP hierarchies and quantum information, is to say, well, let's assume such a model does exist and then see what necessary conditions this would impose on what's called a moment matrix. So you can think of this as a matrix that's um, indexed or its rows and columns are indexed by some um, monomials of operators that are typically the states, measurement operators, and some products of these. Um, and we're also going to include an extra operator, which I'll call sigma, which we will use to enforce the operational equivalences. And so by fixing the, the set of monomials um, with which we use to create um, moment matrix, we fix the level of the hierarchy. So the elements of the moment matrix are given by this. So we just take the trace of the product of say the operator on the, on the row and the column. And then we can kind of start to fill in this or look at what the elements of this matrix look like. So already we can see, for example, we have some places where say we have the trace of a state and we know because these have to be valid quantum states that this will have the value one, right? So we can fix some, some values of our moment matrix, but other things we can't fix, right? So we don't fix say anything about the dimension. So we can't say what the, the trace of the identity is. This is an unknown within the matrix. And then we can look, what else do we know? Well. If we look at these terms here, let's say the trace of a state and a measurement, we know that this is the born rule, right? This is going to be a probability. Um, so we can fill in some of the probabilities in the matrix, but these also appear in some other places, right? Here we have the same thing. We have the, um, the trace of, say, uh, identity times rho e. Okay? And also, since we have projective measurements, we use the cyclicity of the trace, we again get the same probability, right? So we kind of get some structure to the matrix, we can fill in some values, but in general, most of the matrix, we don't know what the values are. So we have a lot of unknowns, but we have some structure that says, okay, some of these unknowns are equal to each other, for example. So we have this matrix um, with many variables, some fixed values and some constraints, and kind of a fundamental result uh, in these SDB hierarchies is that these moment matrix matrices have to be positive semi-definite. So this already gives us some necessary conditions for the existence of a quantum model reproducing the statistics. But thus far, this is just kind of standard to most hierarchy approaches. We haven't said anything about contextuality, in particular the operational equivalences or the fact that these states um, can't be assumed to be, to be projective. We have to enforce that these are positive operators, not just that they have trace one. So how do we do this? Well, um, we use what are called localizing matrices. And so I'll first uh, talk about the, the simplest of the, the, the two uh, problems, which is the, the positivity of the states. So what we do is we build another matrix that has a, a similar form to the moment matrix, except now it's what we say hinged on a state. So we kind of have the state sandwiched between our list of operators. And so we get a matrix like this. We see that there's some, some values that we know. We have some probabilities. And then there's some unknown um, unknown things, these are non-physical quantities, if you like. But the, the key point here is that all of the elements of the localizing matrix are actually elements of the main moment matrix. Okay? So it somehow it localizes a submatrix of the moment matrix. And if the state is positive semi-definite, then this localizing matrix will itself be positive semi-definite. So this provides an effective way to actually enforce the positive semi-definiteness of the states. And so the second problem is how to enforce the operational equivalences. This is maybe a little bit more subtle, um, but just to give an example, if I take the same operational equivalence as I had before, we can see that if these are satisfied, it will imply the existence of some operator sigma, and this is indeed the, the same sigma I included in my list of operators, that satisfies some constraints. Okay? And, and then just to give the intuition, we can think of sigma as being proportional to, say, each of the terms here that are equal to each other. So one constraint is that this, the trace of this should be one third. Um, the normalization is not so important, but this we can think of as encoding somehow this zero information constraint from the zero information interpretation of non-contextuality. And already this imposes some extra constraint on our, on our moment matrix. And then we have these equalities, right? That just says the sigma is proportional to each of these terms. And okay, we can't directly impose such a constraint on the sigma matrices, 
but we can do it indirectly via a localizing matrix in the same way as we did for positivity of states. And we can see that if these constraints are satisfied, then this localizing matrix I define here, um, this, this part here in the middle brackets will be zeros, and so this matrix is identically zero. In practice, this doesn't work very well because it's a lot of equality constraints and numerically this is quite unstable. What we can do is we relax this and just ask this matrix to be positive semi-definite. And so the, the SDP solvers will generally optimize this towards equality anyway, and we get a much more robust uh, hierarchy. And so putting all of these things together, we basically arrive at our SDP hierarchy. We have the, the positivity of the main moment matrix, the localizing matrices, and then all of these extra uh, equality constraints I had to discuss. Right? This, this is the kind of essence of how we formulate our hierarchy. And then I guess the question is, what can we do with it? How well does it work? Are these necessary conditions strong enough to obtain non-trivial results? And I guess the answer is yes, because otherwise I probably wouldn't be here telling you about it. Um, so we're able to use it to obtain actually tight upper bounds on the violation of several non-contextuality inequalities. But I won't go through these and list them. I think if you're really interested in this, you should have a look at the paper. Instead, I want to kind of discuss uh, one, I think, more conceptually interesting result, which comes back to this question of comparing mixed states and pure states in contextuality scenarios. So you can say, are pure states as useful as mixed states? So the standard argument, at least in Bell inequalities and many other quantum information scenarios, is that, OK, we have mixed states, but we can always purify this and have a pure state, right? It's not particularly important. But the problem with contextuality is that if you take a purification, the purification might not itself satisfy the operational equivalences. So it might not pre you know, give a valid solution to the quantum scenario, if you like. And then we can ask, well, can we, for example, obtain a better violation of an inequality using mixed states than pure states? This would be something you don't get with Bell inequalities, for example. And this is something we can actually look at with our hierarchy by taking a pure version of the hierarchy where we impose some extra additional constraints, say that all of the states square to themselves. And so this imposes extra constraints on the elements of the, of the moment matrix. Um, and it also already implies that the, the states will be positive semi-definite. So we don't even need the localizing matrices when we do this. And so using this hierarchy, we were able to indeed find some cases where there is an advantage from mixed states. I won't go over giving the, the particular scenario. I don't think it's necessarily so interesting, other than to say um, that the case where we did find an advantage was the one described in this paper here. So it's a communication game based on a random access code. And in the paper, they already showed the non-contextual bound is two thirds in this game, right? So the, the maximum probability of winning in a non-contextual model. And this gives a non-contextuality inequality. And we were able to use our pure version of a hierarchy to show that there's actually no violation using pure states at all. Okay? So up to numerical precision, you recover the non-contextual bound. And it was already known that one can actually violate this using mixed states. So we really see a case where we have an advantage from mixed states. Okay? We were even able to uh, put a fairly good upper bound on the possible violation using mixed states with the full version of our hierarchy. I think that's one rather nice example of what one can do with our hierarchy. There's some other aspects. In particular, we looked at um, bounding simulation costs or, or looking at how one could simulate not, um, contextual correlations. But I, I don't really have time to go over that. I think I'd rather hand over to Vicky to let her describe her hierarchy. And if people are interested, I can explain or, or discuss this after the talk. So with that, I'll stop sharing and hand back over to you, Vicky. Thank you. Um... Okay. Uh, so this is where we were. This was. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Alistair. So now I'll tell you a bit about the hierarchy from our work, uh, and you can see the title of our work here, and and we'll give you the links at the end again as well. Um, so I just want to first reiterate something that uh, Alistair told you. Uh, so he was telling you that if you uh, restrict the states. Uh, in your um, in the quantum case to being pure states, then you can't realize all quantum behaviors. So we could call this uh, this subset of behaviors that you can reach using pure states Q psi, and then kind of they're displayed on this diagram here as being a, a subset of Q. Um, yeah. So in general, when you have some preparational equivalences, you'll get that this is a strict subset. 
but then also something that he didn't mention is the same thing holds uh, for the measurements. So if you assume that your POVMs are actually projective measurements, so each of the effects uh, squares to itself, then the set that you would get, uh, so we call that Q pi from adding in this constraint is also a subset of Q. And this didn't hold in the case that um, Alistair was uh, uh, talking to you about because he was not assuming that there were any measurement equivalences. But in general, when you put some measurement equivalences in, you get that Q pi is a strict subset of Q. So you can't do everything with projective measurements in contextuality scenarios. Um, so this, this fact is going to be relevant later, which is why I'm reminding you of it. But I'll tell you again also at the time. <laughs> Um, so I'll just tell you uh, a little bit about how our hierarchy works, but most of the legwork was already done by Alistair, so thanks for that. Um, but so basically we're looking for a necessary condition. So if you have some behavior P and it is in Q, we want, uh, we want to find a necessary condition for that. Um, so what we do, so whereas Alistair had uh, one big moment matrix, we take a moment matrix for every row X. So for every row X, we define gamma X. Um, and so this is a moment matrix and we say it's hinged on row X. So for some sequence of operators, the elements of our matrix are given by this formula. So below, I've given you the case uh, where you take your sequence of operators to be the, uh, the effects in your quantum realization. And this gives you a matrix that looks like this. Uh, and as Alistair told you, because this is a moment matrix, it will be positive semi-definite. So that's one condition that we know that this matrix has to satisfy. Uh, and it will also satisfy some linear um, constraints uh, based on the operational equivalences. So in the case of the preparational equivalences, uh, these constraints are very simple because basically the same mixtures of row X, which need to sum together to be the same thing. If you take those mixtures of the gamma X's, they also need to uh, sum together to be the same thing. So those are very simple. Uh, and the for the measurement equivalences, uh, you just do that. That's kind of element wise on the uh, on some of the elements of the matrix. So, so far we've got positive semi-definiteness, some linear constraints. And then finally we have that the, so here the first row of the uh, matrix, you can see that this is actually just gonna be, uh, well, one in the first case, but then followed by the elements of the behavior. So this is like the trace of the uh, E00 zero zero with row X, which is uh, P00, zero zero, uh, P0, zero X0. Zero. Um, so basically the first row and the first column will be elements of your behavior. So here we have that if you can find a matrix which it satisfies these three uh, sets of constraints, then um, that is a necessary condition for your behavior P to be in the quantum set, which is what we were looking for. So this is a necessary condition given by a semi-definite feasibility problem, which there exists efficient algorithms to solve. Uh, however, as I've currently described uh, these constraints to you, they would be really not very good. They would be very bad. Uh, and that's because in none of these three constraints are we doing anything to bound the diagonal terms of this matrix and that basically makes everything very bad. Like the, the program can just make these numbers very, very big to keep this matrix positive semi-definite. Um, and we don't get a very good bound. So the way that Alistair and in the, the Bell scenario uh, case, the way that they can get around this problem is by assuming that these POVMs are projective measurements. And there you see that now on this diagonal, if E0, 0 squared is equal to E0, 0, this is an extra constraint you can put in, then uh, the, these diagonal elements are again going to be just equal to the elements of the behavior. So then this allows you to bound those and it becomes much better. But we're trying to treat the case where you have measurement equivalences as well, so projective measurements are not enough. Um, so try to uh, summarize that there. So the problem is we can't assume projective measurements because if you remember this Q pi was a subset of Q, so then we have to find another way to solve this problem. 
Um, and the way that we do that is by this helpful lemma, which tells us that for every effect E, there exists some unitary operator U uh, satisfying this equality. So E is equal to the identity over two plus U plus U dagger over four. Um, so now for each one of our effects, E, Y, B, instead we can use U, Y, B and U, Y, B dagger. And we use these operators to index our moment matrix instead. Um, so now uh, we have this necessary condition, which instead, uh, so that the constraint that it's positive semi-definite will still hold because it's still a moment matrix. It will still satisfy some operational equivalences, some uh, linear constraints coming from these equivalences. And now instead of this uh, third constraint, uh, we just have that, um, you have to add together like two elements of the first row and then you get some something that's linearly related to the elements of the behavior instead. So we basically, we still have the three constraints from before, we can still impose those, but then we also get this extra constraint which saves the day, uh, which is because these, uh, because we're now indexing by unitaries, all the diagonal elements are gonna have to be, gonna have to be equal to one, right? Because so the diagonal elements, you'll have the trace of u dagger u rho x, which is just the trace of rho x, which is equal to one. So then we get rid of the unboundedness problem in our diagonal elements. Um, so uh, if we do this, um, we find this. So the, um, the behaviors for which you can find such a matrix, we call that set Q1, and this is going to outer bound the set Q. You can also go to higher levels of the hierarchy uh, and find subsets of Q1, uh, but I'm not going to go into how to do that in this talk, but maybe you already know. Um, and I also won't go into the specific uh, inequalities which we, so, which we investigated, but basically for every, uh, we tried a, a broad variety of non-contextuality inequalities and using our SDP, we were able to find uh, tight bounds up to seven decimal places for every single one. Most of them using the first level of the hierarchy, which is the one that I've described to you. And occasionally we had to go to the second level, uh, but we were always able to find these bounds. Um, so now I'll just uh, quickly tell you about uh, an application um, that we found for our hierarchy. So before uh, Alistair was telling you about these um, uh, random access codes, parity oblivious random access codes. So basically there's, you can have a game where you have one party Alice who um, has an input, which is made of, for example, two bits, which she encodes in some preparation and sends it to Bob, who then has to guess either the first bit zero or bit one by doing some measurement. So if he's trying to guess bit one, he'll do some fixed measurement and his guess will be K. So this is kind of a, a boring game until you put on some, uh, some preparation equivalences. So you could, for example, put on this equivalence here. Um, so now this has basically become a contextuality scenario. Um, and so they win the game when Bob's output K is equal to X, Y. So it's equal to the Y bit. Uh, and the reason I'm introducing this to you is because it allows us to define a, a concept that we found called monogamy of contextuality, uh, which basically means if Alice plays this game uh, with two other players at the same time, and those two other players aren't allowed to signal to each other, the um, maximum uh, average success probability that they can find, um, so the so if, if Alice was playing with just one player using quantum theory, this number would be 0 0.788, the maximum average success probability. But in the scenario where she's playing with two players at the same time, their maximum average success probability is sum to 1.329 approximately, which is less than two times the individual one. So essentially, uh, if Alice and Bob see that they're getting this 0 0.788, they know that the contextuality shared between Alice and Charlie has to be less than the maximum. So we call this a uh, monogamy of contextuality. Uh, and we were kind of able to use this idea 
to develop a semi-device independent quantum key distribution protocol. With the idea being that now you can see uh, Charlie as an eavesdropper, Eve, uh, who is trying to spy on Alice and Bob. But then basically you can, uh, Alice and Bob, if they find their SB, their average maximum success probability, then they can bound um, the uh, contextuality that uh, Eve can share with Alice which then allows them to lower bound this expression here, which we showed gives you a lower bound on the key rate that Alice and Bob can share. Um, and then in this graph here, so we used a hierarchy to find what these lower bounds would be for different uh, success probabilities for different values of this SB. So here we're in the achievable quantum range, less than 0.788, and we're getting a non-zero key rate. So. Uh, that was the idea. Um, okay, so now I'll let Alice to summarize. Yep, so I guess I'll, do, I'll wrap up and okay, I guess you saw, okay, we both had two different um, hierarchies for the same problem, um, but they were based on somewhat different ideas and I think each of them has different advantages and disadvantages. Um, so in my hierarchy, I, I, oh, our hierarchy was based on this connection to zero information games and these information restricted correlations and we use this to kind of look at several examples including in particular studying the question of how to simulate um, contextual correlations and Vicky used her hierarchy to to show the monogamy of contextuality and to develop an SDI QKD protocol that is based on this so I think that there's a few questions um, that are common to both hierarchies and some that are maybe apply just to one or the other, but okay, the obvious question here is, is whether the hierarchies converge, and I don't think either of us are, are sure of the answer to this, and I suspect it's not the same maybe in both cases because the hierarchies are kind of built on. So maybe I'll wrap up there and thank you for your attention. We can take questions. I see there are plenty in the chat.